concept is love? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Love is... Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Love actually feels kind of nice. It does. It feels like a spark. Love is about happiness, friendship, sharing, caring, and playing with each other. Love feels like you're brave and mighty. When two people meet and the heart to heart. If you take someone to Hawaii, they would fall in love with you. Hugging, kissing. Ew. That's gross. But there's much more to love than kissing. For crushes, you could tell if a boy is mean to girls, that means they have a crush on you. I think you sometimes say goofy stuff or feel goofy. Doing this in front of people. And now I have a crush on an older kid. She kept on looking up from her math test and staring at me, so. I don't remember his name. I just think he's handsome. Oh. Sometimes you can't choose who you love. Like a family member, sometimes you just love them. I know my, my mom, mom loves me because she gives me love, kisses, hugs. She makes lots of food so I can get strong. Mostly my dad loves me a lot. He loved me since when I was like zero. I know my sister loves me because when my cats attack me, she's the first person at my side asking what happened. Love happened because two people fall in love. No one invented it. Love came from the beginning of the world, when the world started. Our hearts everywhere. Good morning, Hope. So glad that you're here. I love that video for so many reasons. One, I love it because sometimes when you ask a kid a question, uh, they give you just an honest answer, and we realize that it's a lot simpler than we make it. That question, what is love? I, my, my two favorite answers. One is, uh, if, if somebody brings me to Hawaii, I'll love them. Sounds pretty good right about now. The second thing is, uh, love is like being able to do this in front of somebody, which really kind of, that's the way it kind of feels like sometimes. We're like, whoo, I just want to do that. But I think love is something that is a lot easier than we make it. If you answer the question, what is love, how, how would you answer it? I mean, there are so many different ways in which we can answer that question. Just the other day, uh, I was driving with uh, my, my son and my daughter, and two, they each had brought a friend. We were going Wednesday night to church, and so in my car, there was four of us. Like, my daughter, Jade, she drew the short straw, so she was sitting in the front seat with me, and then in the back seat, it was sheer, sheer chaos. So it was my son and, and two friends, and, and they were just going nuts. And so what I do when it's nuts in my car is I just turn the radio up. Like, that's just what I do. So I was listening to good music. I was listening to Pearl Jam. I'm in a Pearl Jam station right now, and there was a really good song on, and the song that was on uh, was the song Sirens, and so if you're a Pearl Jam fan, you know the song Sirens, it's beautiful, it's amazing, and so my daughter, sitting next to me, she has to endure the fact that when certain parts of this song come, I'll lean over to her, and I'll be like, sweetheart, you just have to listen to this part of the song, and she said, dad, be quiet, I'm like, no, I'm serious this time, you have to listen to this part of the song, and she said, you always say that. I'm like, no, sweetheart, I love this song. And you know what she said? She said, Dad, you love every song. Like, what's different about this one? And I think that's the fact of, of love, is sometimes we ascribe the term love to so many different things. I mean, think about it. I can love that song. And I can love my team. And I can love my favorite foods. And I can love my kids. And I can love my wife. And all of those words would accurately describe what I'm loving. But But what does it mean? The fact that I can love my team and love my wife, it's different, isn't it? And so we need to ask ourselves the question again, is, is, is what is love? In English, we sum it up with one word. In, in other languages, there are many different words that would describe love. And I think because of that, there's a lot of myths that are associated with love. When we think about love, a lot of us say, well, love is, it's, it's a feeling. Like when the things are happening in just the right way, I feel a certain way. And when I feel a certain way, that's love. Now, now don't get me wrong. I believe that there is this beauty that comes in love that has these feelings that come alongside of it. But what happens when they don't? 
I mean, if you've been in a relationship with anyone, I'm not just talking a significant other, I'm even just talking friends. If you've been in a relationship for any time at all, you realize that feelings come and feelings go. Feelings are very fickle. We need to accurately prescribe to what we should do with our feelings. They're important. Feelings are never wrong, but they're great barometers. They allow us to check the climate of what's going on around us, but they're horrible compasses. It's because feelings come and feelings go. When we talk to people who are in, uh, in a marriage, we'll say, I just, I just fell out of love. No, you didn't. You didn't. Your feelings may be waning. And we say, well, oh, but that's because uh, actions follow our feelings. No, reverse that. If you want the secret to figuring out your feelings, start acting a certain way and see whether or not your feelings follow. Too often we say, well, love, it's just, it's just about how we feel. It's not. Or sometimes we say love is all about agreement. Like I can love somebody if I agree with all the ways in which they're acting. <laughs> Do you have kids? <laughs> have you spent any time around kids? My goodness. Aside from my wife, this side of heaven, the two people I love more than anybody else in this world are my son and my daughter. And do I always agree with how they are behaving and the decisions that they are making? Absolutely not. And there are times where they make a decision, where they do something that I couldn't disagree with more. And does that mean in that moment, in that circumstance, I said, that's it, I don't, I don't love you anymore. But now check yourself on the way in which you interact with the people in the society around you. We've started to do that, haven't we? That if somebody agrees on the issues that I agree with, well, then, then we can love each other, and that love comes quite easily. But if you would dare think about something, believe in something, act on something, that I don't agree with, I'm going to cancel you. I have no time for you. And in fact, I'm going to blow you up on every social media platform that I can because love is based on agreement. No, it's not. It's not at all. Sometimes we say that love is it's, it's based on whether or not we say yes. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times in my own life with my own parents, and I can't tell you how many times in my life as a parent, you kind of hear this phrase, if you loved me, you would do this for me. Like love is like, love is basically, you do what I want you to do. Is that love? Or is that codependency? Or is that enabling? It's not love. And sometimes, the greatest way in which we can love somebody, or somebody can love us, is in a kind way, to say no. To say no. Hey, here, here's the boundary. And I don't give this boundary because I don't love you. I'm giving you this boundary because I do love you. That love isn't based on me saying yes to every whim that you have. Love is based on something more. Sometimes we say that love is a compromise. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There is compromise that takes place in relationships. There are times where I watch Hallmark movies because I love my wife. And there are times where my wife watches, watches more games in one week than she ever thought she'd watch in a lifetime. There's a give and there's a take. But I think when we think that love is a compromise, here's what we do. Here's what we do. When we think that love is all about compromise, and I think we say this in marriages all the time, oh, it's just about compromise. What that means is in order to be in a relationship, in order to love someone, it means I'm always losing something. Is that love? I believe, not compromise, I believe love is giving 100% and receiving 100%. And doing what you can do to pour into the other person, not based on the fact so they'll pour that into you, but, but it's not giving a little and, and, and taking a little and, and making sure that it hits the middle ground, 50%. Sometimes we think that love is, is weak, it's fragile. Or it's for people who are weak, or it's for people who are fragile. 
And maybe I'm stronger than having to be able to, to, to love everyone. Love isn't, love isn't weak. In fact, this word that sometimes we misapply, this word is pointing to something that's the most, it's the most powerful thing in the world. I know you're going, no, it's not the most powerful thing in the world. Force, power, position, status, money, that, that's the most powerful thing. No, it's not. Because those things won't last. They just won't. They don't have the power to. Love is the most powerful thing because it lasts forever. It's the only thing that we have that can change a person's life. It's Paul who writes to the church in Corinth, the, the love chapter. Now, Paul's not penning a poem because he's just one day short of Valentine's Day, and he thinks, I've got to write this poem to, to make sure that, that I say all the right things in something that would fit into a card. Paul's not writing romantic sentiments towards somebody. Paul is writing to people who are trying to figure it out. But what does it mean to follow Jesus? And how does that impact me, and how does that impact the people around me? And so Paul says that, the greatest thing is love. Love is patient. It's kind. It's not envious. It's not boastful. It's not rude. How are you doing? Love doesn't rejoice with injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never fails. It endures through every single circumstance. Three things will last forever, Paul says. Faith, hope, and love. And help me out on this one. The greatest of these is love. It's at the centerpiece of this series that we've been going through. Five habits of highly effective Christians. It's the center. It's the centerpiece of, of, of this series that we're going through, but it's the centerpiece of our lives. Because here's the thing. If we want to truly know what love is, here is the, here's the thing we need to start with is, is that God is love. It's a letter that John writes to early believers in Jesus. The same John who was the one that Jesus loved is writing these truths to, to people and trying to remind them the power of love. So John writes, God, God is love. Now, I, I don't know. There's a lot of us, I think, that we, we would have a, a view that maybe doesn't contradict that, but doesn't maybe totally align with that. I mean, sometimes I think we think about God, and we think that maybe God is more of judgment or anger or somebody who's kind of picking apart all of the things that we do wrong or he's distant. Or he's apathetic. Now he's love. And as a result of that, love is all about a choice. But here's the thing. And this is where we need to start. This is what kicks off the whole thing. If we're going to have an accurate description and, and we're going to realize the ultimate power that love has, we got to realize that love isn't about a choice that we make, that love is about a choice that God makes. It's a choice that God makes for you. Just before John writes that God is love, he says, greater love has no other sign than this, that he laid his life down. It's not that you loved God first. It's not that you had to do anything to get God to love you. God loves you. It isn't that God just loves the people in the world that somehow fit a certain criteria. It's that God loves all people. It doesn't matter whether or not they agree with that. It doesn't matter whether or not they're even open to that or accept that. Our opinions, our boundaries... Our ideas don't get to dictate what God is and who God is and how God acts. God is love, and his love is for you. And it's when we start to realize that, and we start to accept that, and we start to live as that as the reflex of our lives rather than what we only give when somebody earns it, is we start to realize the power. 
Because it finds us. Or it found you. Wherever it is that you are. See, the thing that's so crazy about love, about God's love, is that it's a love that, that pursues you. Somehow, in some way, you found yourself here today. Whether it's here in person, whether it's online, whether it's at one of our local sites, you found yourself here. And we believe, I believe, whether you came willingly or you're kicking and screaming, that's not an accident. Jesus says, just before he's going to be arrested and, and put to his death, he says, as the Father has loved me, he's telling his disciples, he's telling you, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You don't need to ask for it. Love finds you wherever it is that you are. And here's the beautiful part, is it that it doesn't have any conditions. It's not transactional. It doesn't have to fit certain things. Which I believe, I really do believe, is so hard for us to come to terms with. Because we want to know the rules. We want to know the boundaries. We want to know who's in and who's out. Who's good and who's bad. Who's right and who's wrong. But the love that God has, it's unconditional. One of my mentors, uh, an incredible person in my life, one of those people that you go to when you just have big questions, big life questions. And he and I were talking one time, and he told me a time in his life where uh, one of his kids was going to a, a horrible time. One of those uh, times in life where his kid was rebelling in every single way. And he and his wife, they started to wonder if they're going to lose their kid. Like if that relationship was going to just completely be lost. So my mentor was telling me, he said that we, we, we had to go and we had to see a, a counselor, a therapist, which just as a side note, is not a sign of weakness. Life is throwing things at us every single day. And give yourself grace if you can't figure it out. Those of you who are parents, you, you know that there are things that happen that you're just like, didn't believe that just happened. Like, what, what, what do I do? And sometimes we say, well, I can't let anybody know that I, I don't know what I'm doing. We don't, none of us really know what we're doing. So he and his wife, they went and talked to a counselor. And they spent some time with his counselor, with, with their child. And, and they spent some time a, as a group. And then their, their child left the room for a little bit of time. And the, the counselor had some time with, with just these two parents. And the counselor said to, to them, so you... you You'll get your kid back as long as they know that you love them. So of, course, of course we do. Do they know that? Or do they maybe think that what's been going on right now has maybe canceled that? I wonder how that changes our relationships. If we start loving, that doesn't mean that you're a doormat. It doesn't mean that somehow you just say, well, anything goes. It means that your love remains as everything goes. It's Jesus, the most well-known passages in Scripture, for God so loved the world. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Gates are wide open. God loves first. Love has no conditions. And because of that, love has the ability to turn the other cheek. To not respond to anger with anger. Jesus says, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and, and hate your enemy. But it's going to be different 
with you. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't respond with anger, with anger. I mean, we tell this to, to people all the time. We say, two wrongs don't make a, then why don't we? Why do we do that? Why don't we do that? Last weekend, my son had a, a basketball tournament in Iowa City, and uh, on Saturday, his first game was at 3.30. His second game wasn't until 8.30 at night. And so the time between 3.30 and 8.30, he and our daughter, what they did was drank sugar, ate sugar, and consumed caffeine. It was bananas. Like, it was nuts. And so after all of that, then he has one more basketball game at 8.30, which isn't going to get done until 9.30. Then we go back to the hotel, which has like a million and five people in it. And so we told our kids, as we're in the car driving back to the hotel, we're like, don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go right to the room. Don't put, put your blinders on. Don't say hi to anybody. We're going up to the room, and as soon as we get to the room, you're going to brush your teeth, you're going to go to the bathroom, and you're going to go to bed. And that's exactly what they did. No, they didn't. It was miserable. It was like the worst, like, half hour of my life. So we get into the hotel. They, 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 got to the, they got to the elevator, and they're checking each other into the elevator. And you're like, uh, you want to scare them. You want to be like, if you check each other in the elevator, the elevator is going to fall. And then you realize, and then they'll never get on an elevator for the rest of their life. And then you'll spend your life walking upstairs. So we didn't do that. But as soon as we get into the hotel room, our daughter Jade, who loves gymnastics, I don't love when she loves gymnastics at 10 o'clock at night. So she's doing aerials, which is a, a cartwheel without hands, on the end of one of the beds, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm like, Jade, stop. Jade, stop. Jade, stop. Jade, stop. Jade, stop. Jade, stop. And like, I'm getting louder and louder and louder. And then our son comes out of the bathroom because he had gone to the bathroom, brushed his teeth. And as he's going to his bed, you would think that he would just walk by very kindly. No, she's midair and he checks her into the wall and the chair goes everywhere. And so he starts yelling at her. She starts yelling at him and I start yelling at the both of them. I'm like, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And Bridget looks at me and she said, no, you. Your anger isn't making this better. And either is ours. Do you want to know one of the biggest challenges that people who aren't a part of the church have with the church? Is sometimes they believe that the church is hypocritical. That they talk about love, but they don't practice love. That we need to let people have it. That maybe our volume is going to be the thing that's going to define us. It doesn't work. Martin Luther King Jr., who whose life we celebrate this tomorrow. He, we're going to do it at Hope Elam at 11.30. You're invited. It's going to be amazing. Earl Smith, chaplain for the 49ers and for the Golden State Warriors. He was a former chaplain at San Quentin uh, Prison. Cool thing is, is that he's actually flying into Des Moines after the 49ers play their playoff game uh, today. It's, it's commitment. We're going to do that to celebrate his life, Martin Luther King Jr., who faced opposition, who faced hatred, who faced people who were threatening to take his life. And one of the statements that lives alongside of his legacy is darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can. If there's somebody who's acting and behaving in a way that's hurtful, rather than trying to hurt them, try loving them. And see how it goes. Because one of the things that I've learned about hate is hate's linked to anger, then anger's linked to fear, and then fear is linked to control. Isn't it interesting that none of us are hate-filled people? No, we're God's children. But some of us have gotten to a place of hate because we've become so angry, and that anger is because 
we're so f- fearful and scared that we try to control things. And when we feel out of control, we resort to all those other things. If you want to know where your greatest fears fall, look at your life and where you're exerting the most control. Where are you trying to force something? Happens in relationships all the time. But here's the power of love is that God says that it's in, in, in my love, you, you don't have to be scared. You, you don't have to, to live in fear. You don't have to be the one who's in control because you feel out of control because I'm the one, God says, who will always be with you. You're never alone. Such love has no fear, John writes, because perfect love, God's love, it expels fear. You realize that you're not in it alone. I was researching this past week and I came across a statistic that one researcher said that one in four people feel that they're not worthy of being loved. One of four people, like you peel all the layers back. All the layers of things that we try to do to try to make it seem as if we're, we're just okay. And down at the core, we kind of wonder whether or not we're worthy or we're good enough. If somebody actually knew who we were, would they still love us and accept us? It was during the Great Depression that there was something that was happening where there were more and more families that were having children that they weren't able to provide for the basic needs of those children, those infants. Because we all know, right, that the most primal basic needs that we have as human beings is for food, for water, and for shelter. And so families were having these children. They realized that we weren't able to provide for those basic needs. And so they started to hand these children off to wards of the state or orphanages. And the orphanages were doing the best they could to provide for these most primal, basic needs for for these babies. And what they realized is that there were babies that were dying due to starvation with a bottle that was at their lips. And what they realized is that even as an infant who wasn't able to formulate a word or a thought, That the most basic and the most primal need that a human being, any human being, no matter what age you are, the most primal need is not food, it's not water, it's not shelter, it's love. They coined a phrase at the time, it was called anaclytic depression. The word anaclytic literally means to lean on. That they were dying, they were wasting away because they didn't believe inherently that there was anybody in this world that they could lean on. They were void of love. Think about it now. Children are born. The first thing they do is they're given to a person who's able to place their skin on. And in tragic and heartbreaking situations where that's not possible, there is somebody who steps in to provide the warmth that the child basically needs. Or... And here's the thing, church. You're the warmth. That's your call. That's all of our call. Because we have a God that we can lean on. We're called to be the ones that make sure that the people around us know that they are not alone. And that this love that God has It restores, puts back together that which is broken. Jesus tells a story. He tells a story, Luke chapter 15, based on the incredible love of God. He tells a story of a a man who had two sons. You know the story. 
And one of the sons says to his dad, Dad, I don't want to be with you any longer. I want my inheritance now. And he receives his money and he, he leaves town and he wastes it all. He has nothing left. And he gets to a place with nothing that he wonders if he could ever go home. But the problem is, is the, the way in which he's blown up that relationship could never be restored. But he goes back. And he gets to the edge of his father's property. And it isn't the son who crosses the boundary to come home. Don't miss that. It's the father who goes beyond the boundary to welcome the son home. To restore his child. The one who is lost is now found. That is love. A love that restores. A love that puts back together all the things that were broken. That only God's love can do that. That's why it's the most powerful thing. What else on earth has the power to do this? Because it not just only transforms or restores us, but it transforms us. Changes us. One of the people who are there, uh, the day in which Jesus was put to death. She's one of the only people who's left. Her name's Mary, and she's there along with Jesus' mother, Mary. And she's there with the disciple, John. A handful of other women are there. They're the only ones left. Everybody else had turned, and they had ran. This Mary is also the same person that's there the, the, that Sunday morning when she goes to the tomb, and she realizes that the stone had been rolled away. And Jesus appears to her, and so then she, she goes and she tells everybody that he was raised from the dead. You say, how oh, amazing would it have been to be Mary? But Mary's story didn't start there. And when we know the rest of Mary's story, the reality and the possibility of her being there is what's well, unbelievable. And you start to realize that something, something happened to her. Something changed her. Something transformed her. Take a look. I don't know what else I can do to help you. Give me that. Lots of it. That's not going to solve your problems. It's meant to distract from No that. more preaching. Just give it to me. Lilith, please. Listen to what I'm saying. I said, leave me. How do you know my name? 
Thus says the Lord who created you. And he who formed you. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. moment everything changed for Mary is when she heard those words. Mary, you're mine. Not in a selfish way, not in a possessive way, but in a transformative way. That the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who stands outside of time, entered into time, to live into this world, to experience life, to give his life, to lay it down and exhaust it out on the cross, and to go to the grave for you so that you would know that you are loved and you are his. And that as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, the scriptures tell us, we too might live new lives. Your new life starts now. It starts today. If you've never known the depth of God's love, hear it today. God loves you. God loves you without condition. God loves you where you are. God loves you in a way that transforms you, that restores you, that brings you home, that allows you to know that that you're his. And it's in that that you get to share that. Because love is great and love is wonderful, but the power of God's love is something that we just can't keep to ourselves sends us out. It's the end of this passage that we heard read at the beginning of worship. It says the command we have from Christ is blunt. It's simple. It's obvious. I mean, Jesus earlier in the Gospels was asked the question, what's the most, in th- most important thing? What's the most important rule? What's the po- most important law? What does Jesus say? It's love God and love others. The command we have from Jesus Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving loving people. You have to do both. Church, we need to do both. It's one of the habits that won't just transform the world around us. It'll transform the lives inside of us. Because that's who God is. And that's what God does. He brings life. He brings love. He brings light. He brings hope because of his love. So I invite you to stand wherever you are. Local sites, campuses, stand as well. And I'm going to read this prayer that that Paul has in his letter to the Ephesians. I invite you to close your eyes. And as as we do this, I just want you to, to hear these words. Paul writes in... Ephesians chapter 3. He says, When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. 
And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.